What's up, everybody? Wait a few more minutes here. Hey, guys, let's mask back up out there. If you're still breaking. Hello, is whatever. One more minute. All right, let's get to it here. All right, what do we got going on today? First of all, uh, to prepare for the book after that, I'm going to post it kind of last half of the day Thursday, and then you're going to have Thursday night through Friday day to do the book after. Here's a quiz waiting for you. Practice. Okay. So it's up to you how much you do that. I like to see you guys in there doing that and do it a lot. The test will be Friday. It's going to kind of be a low pressure test. 
Um, I'll just click just go to preview that view. As long as you do it completely and on time, you'll get full credit. Okay, so there's no reason to cheat. Give it a try, see if you do. And then over the week, I'm going to post a key. In the beginning of the next week, I'll have you kind of repost your test. You having done correction. And if you do those two tasks on time, then you get full credit on the test. If you don't, then you get kind of like late penalties taken off. Okay, no matter how many you miss. There's no reason to cheat. So just throw it out there. Uh, but I'd still like you to practice this, practice learning them, and I will give you Okay, uh, grammar lesson six tomorrow night. All for love. Unit Romeo and Juliet Act two study guide was due last night and has I'm not looking at it. I don't know how many of you in the end. I hope it's all of you, but we're here at the class today. Okay. So which covers that? Not up. And change my grid a little bit here. I'll do it once. There we go. No, for the day. All right, so key passage. I had some people do this this time, but it wasn't enough. Let's look at it together. Juliet says, "'Tis but thy name that is thy enemy." When it says thy, it just means you. You or your, he, thy, all that stuff. So that, it's just an unfamiliar, what you call an archaic pronoun. "'Tis my name that is my, thy name that is thy enemy. Your name, Montague, right? Thou art thyself, but not a Montague. What is a Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be, please, just be some other name. He knows, she knows he can't, right? But she wishes that he could change, that he could be something else other than what is called a Montague. What's in a name? What's in a name anyway? That which we call a rose by any other name smells sweet. So Romeo would, if he weren't called Romeo, he would still retain that dear perfection that he owes without that title. Romeo doth, which means like shed off. Shed your name. And for that name, which is no part of the tick all myself. So she wishes that he could get rid of that name, right? I mean, we can't really get rid of it. I mean, you know, modern people can sort of change our names really want to. He's their own. What are some of the situations in our own world where people are enemies based simply on name? I think in terms of tribal names, religious traditions, as well as family. Well, that could apply to all kinds of stuff, right? Can you guys think of anything? I'd love to hear your voices today. He seems to suggest that names identify people, things don't ultimately define them. Do you agree? Like, what are some ways that we're defined labels or names we wish didn't have to miss so much? Is what that means. Whether you did it or not, what do you think? Voices or chat? <laughs> what are ways that you or different groups of people in the world are judged or defined? terms that apply to them, whether it's names, terms, but you can think of them. Oh, double plus, you got to share. Now I'm going to be patient. Can't think of anything, really. Can't think of any way that we label people that creates expectations that they wish that they didn't have to have about themselves like um i know some people like who um like if you like read a book and stuff they call you like nerd and stuff you know like labels you know like names right like labels like you put on like stuff like the person like i don't even know what to say like keep keep thinking out loud let's go ahead Do you mean like, do you mean kind of like, uh, like kind of click stereotypes, kind of labels, like that kind of thing, social groups or what? Yeah, I mean like, yeah. Whoops, hold on a second. I got some kind of other broadcast going on here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Ethan said is. Ethan said what? Oh, Ethan was the one who was saying something.
Hmm. You guys seem to be frozen. I wonder if you can hear me. Huh, well, this stinks. You guys still here? My Zoom froze up. That has, ne that has never happened before. <laughs> Weird. Okay, let me get back to my screen share. We've only got a few questions to talk about here, so we got plenty of time. There we go. Okay, now. We were confused as to who was talking, but someone was telling us something. I don't know whether it was Ethan or Elias about some answer to that question. What are some examples of ways that people are identified that ultimately shouldn't have to define them? Can I get an answer? Oh, I got a chat. They say that people read books or made fun of because they're like, sure. I would hope none of you guys would do that. <laughs> That'd be terrible. That's kind of dipping into, you know, maybe kind of different social groups or types of people like in your world, right? Um, stereotypes of jocks, stereotypes of, like you said, bookworms, stereotypes of... Uh, you know, people like this or like that. It could be that, right? Or it could actually be your name, you know? Say your name traces to a certain sort of, uh, I feel like your name shouldn't have to define yourself, okay? Yeah, I would think so. And that's what they're mad about in the story, right? She is mad that, that Romeo's name has to define who he is. Now, does it? Maybe to a certain degree, right? Um, but he should be able to be whoever he wants and be with whoever he wants, despite what his name is, is her point, right? But this could go into, you know, do we define someone because they come from a family that has a certain political belief? Your personality should. All right, well said, Tammy. A certain political belief, a family that's of a certain religion, especially if it's maybe a, a religion that is not as prominent as, as one major religion, uh, anything like that, okay? So, all right, as long as we understand her frustration there, that's what's important. Let's go to the questions. So first one is in the most famous line in the play, Romeo, Romeo, this is when she's on the balcony, right? Wherefore art thou Romeo? Despite this line's fame, many people misunderstand, misread or misunderstand it. What is Juliet asking and worrying about here? Now, if you read the translation, you look at the side by side, you'll know that Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo does not mean Romeo, where are you? Wherefore does not mean where. It's an archaic word, which means out of use. What does it mean? It doesn't mean where, what does it mean? It goes along with the whole first passage, right? Saying Romeo, Romeo, what? Who took the trouble to look? This is one of the questions you answered. What does it mean? Not where are you, but what? Nobody got it. Why are you? Thank you, Elias. Why are you Romeo? Which really means why are you what? Why are you a? That type of person. What type of person? I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Well, it's it, there's no describing it. Well, my point is that she's that, that she's pointing out. It, it's really about his last name, right? What she means is Romeo, Romeo. Why do you have to be a Montague? Which is what Romeo is, even though she's not saying it. Okay, so a lot of people just kind of assume that word for means where, because you see the word where in there. But what she's really saying is, why do you have to be a Montague? That sucks, you know, because that means it's going to be really hard for us to be together. Okay, second question. Although Juliet notes that she experiences joy. In Romeo's presence on the balcony, she also says she has no joy of this contract tonight. What is her main concern at this moment? Support your answer with evidence from the text. Um, in other words, what is she scared about? What does she say after, I, I can have no joy in this contract tonight? <clears throat> I get that one. She feels like it is, it's in too much of a what, which we would probably agree with. 
uh, she, like she feels like she's like <clears throat> she's forced to like forced to what? Forced to like marry him or something? No, she's not forced to. She's getting caught up in it too, Watch. but at the same time, yeah, exactly. At the same time, she feels like it's maybe a little bit too rushed. Um, Ethan, you're on the right track by saying it's a it certainly is a risk, right? So it's part of the reason why she's nervous about it being in a rush is because it is a risk, right? Because both of their parents would probably be furious unless, you know, it's hard to imagine how it could be explained to them, like the friar is explaining, is, is uh, claiming that he'll do in, in such a way that they would say, oh, okay, that's fine, you know? Um, okay, good. That's her main concern. Um, she says, it is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden are the words that she says uh, right after that. And she's certainly right, right? Um, Moving forward, number three, what does a friar mean when he says, is Rosaline, remember Rosaline, the one he was so in love with, that thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? Young men's love then lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. I would be very curious, especially to hear Cammy's thoughts on this, the one woman in the room, because this is a, this is a, a generalization of what men are like, apparently, according to the friar, based on Romeo's behavior, right? What's he pointing out that Romeo has done that proves that young men's love lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. What has he done that makes it seem like love is in his eyes rather than his heart? That he cares about looks and not how women truly are. That is exactly what he's saying. What is that evidenced by? In like one of the um, uh, sections, it said um, uh, um, uh, she is like a, a dove among crows. Mm -hmm. Like see, he only cares about like how she looks and stuff. Well, that's that's certainly all he could know because he doesn't even know her yet then, right? So what he's pointing out is how could you, you know, just absolutely forget about this person that you claim that you're completely in love with to claim that you were absolutely in love with someone else that you couldn't possibly know very well, right? And, you know, as much as we think Romeo and Juliet is supposed to be this idealized love story, the friar's gotta be right to some degree, right? I mean, all he does is see her. How could he really know that he's in love with her? And that's what he's pointing out. Nevertheless, he agrees to do what he does, right? For this higher purpose of maybe, um, and uh, can we put that he cares about the looks and not how women truly are. Yeah, that's definitely what he's saying. On to number four. In scene five, Juliet struggles to get the nurse to tell her Romeo's response. What news does the nurse finally tell? So she complains about her aching bone after she talks to Romeo, right? And Mercutio makes fun of her and is really rude to her. Romeo finally tells. Well, what, what does Romeo tell the nurse? Let's kind, of, let's kind of talk through the scene here. Did you guys understand what went on there in that conversation? What's the plan that uh, Romeo tells the nurse that he's supposed to tell Juliet? Go tell her to do what? To meet him somewhere, yes. To get permission to go to what he calls shrift, okay, which is confession, like the sacrament of confession. If any of you grew up Catholic, you might be familiar with that. That's when you go to the priest and you tell him your sins and he tells you how to make up for it, long story short. So she's gonna get permission to go to confession, which would be in the friar's chamber, of course, right? Because he's the priest. But what she's really going there for is to what? Which is kind of crazy because they just met last night. <laughs> what are they doing? What's the friar gonna do for them there? He's going to marry them, like now. They met last night and he's marrying them the next day. And so that makes, when Juliet comes back, or excuse me, when the nurse comes back to Juliet and tells her, that makes Juliet absolutely delighted, all right? because she was afraid that Romeo was just, you know, maybe just, that was just the wine talking, you know, and he was just kind of acting crazy in the middle of the night, but no, he actually meant it. Not that that's necessarily a great idea, uh, but he did mean it. And so if she gets permission to go to confession, she's gonna meet Romeo at Friar Lawrence's chamber and they're gonna be married that day. And indeed they do, and that takes us up to number five. And what advice does the friar give Romeo in act two, scene six, for your answer to the evidence from the text? Let's actually go to that. Two, 
famous lines here. These violent delights have violent ends and in their triumph die like fire and powder, which as they kiss consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in its own deliciousness and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore love moderately, long love doth so. Too swift arrives as tardy as too slow. He says kind of rhyming poetry there. So what he's pointing out by saying these violent delights have violent ends and then giving examples of that is things that are so, the more powerful and sudden or beautiful or intensely enjoyable things are, the easier and the more soon they tend to just kind of burn out and be gone, right? So he's warning them, you're so caught up in this, you know, you're, this is so, you know, crazy, you know, look, like slow down, you know, and maybe this, you know, could be something good. But in a way, isn't that kind of a little bit hypocritical of the, of the friar to say? Because what's he doing right now? He's marrying them, right? But he's got this higher purpose. He's idealistic, so he's gonna, he's gonna do it. Yeah, that is how the scene ends. Come with me. We will make short work for by your leaves. You shall not stay alone till holy church incorporate into one. So they met last night, and the friar has married them. What do you think their families are going to think of this? Do you think the friar will be able to convince them? Hey. It's all good. Everybody should love each other now after decades or centuries or whatever it is of feuding. Everything's going to turn out fine. Mad. Huh? They're going to be mad. Uh, you would think they'd be mad, right? Uh, the friar's got a tough sell there. So we will see. All right. Thanks for being here. Do you guys have any questions about anything else? Everybody understand the schedule? You work on that personal narrative. That's the most important thing. Okay. You've got a, you've got a while to work on Act 3. That's not due until until Sunday night. Okay, so you work on that paper, huge grade, you gotta get it done. Um, work on it today, work on it tonight, leave some room to talk with me about it so you can have the thing turned in, uh, fulfilling all those requirements on the river by Thursday night. Okay, bye-bye, thank you. <laughs>